Now we're going to look a little bit about the range of a linear transformation. So let's say we have a linear transformation, T of X, which is defined by uh, the matrix, some matrix A times X. In other words, I take the matrix A, and A has a bunch of columns in it, and I multiply it by this vector X, and I get a product. Well, I could, re I could write this product uh, the following way. We, we, we learned this in class, that this multiplication, it's going to be X1 times that column, and X2 times the second column, and so on and so forth. And we showed in class, uh, or, or on YouTube or somewhere, we showed why this, this and this are the same thing. It's not that hard to, to see. But that means that the range of T is essentially the same as the column space of the matrix A, because I'm taking all the columns of A, the X, the X1, X2, X3 goes through all the, all the different scalars. So basically I want up here, this is the column, by definition is the column space, this is the range. So we see a theorem that the range of a linear transformation is the same as the column space of the matrix upon which the transformation is based. But wait, there's more. Suppose I gave you a linear transformation. Uh, here's one. It's defined by a matrix A. And, and I ask you to find the basis of the range of this linear transformation. Well, I do that very simply. I, if I take my matrix A and do a bunch of elementary row operations, I get this matrix here. Now, we had this exact matrix uh, like two videos ago. So we did a bunch of row operations, and we got down to here. Well, notice that here's a leading one, and here's a leading one, column one and column three. Well, column one and column three would be the, uh, the, the, the linearly independent columns, which means that column one and column three of my original matrix A is going to be the basis of my kernel. So that's uh, one, negative two, three, that's, the, for, that's column one of the original, and five, negative nine, zero, that's column three of the original. So I see the, the, the columns that, have le that contain leading ones and those columns tell me which columns of the original matrix are the columns that form the basis, and here's our basis, and we are all good. Yay! That was actually a partial yay, not a total yay, because I was just saying yay for that problem, but we're not, we're not done with the video. We have more exciting things. We can now define the dimension of the range of a linear transformation is called the rank of T. The dimension of the kernel of a linear transformation is called the nullity of T. And now we have a theorem rank t plus nullity t equals n very similar to a theorem we had previously um or the dimension of the range of a linear transformation plus the dimension of the kernel of the linear transformation is equal to the dimension of the uh domain that's the dimension of the vector space v um so this is easy to prove i'm not going to do the whole long-winded proof but basically the rank of t came from all the all the uh, columns which contain leading zeros, leading ones, I mean. The nullity of T, if you remember from a couple of videos ago, came from the columns that did not contain linear, that did not contain leading ones. Those were the columns which had this, which got the free variables designated and so on and forth. That's my, my S and T. My S and my T came from the non-leading ones. Well, in a matrix, every column either contains a leading one or doesn't contain a leading one. So between these two, between the rank and the nullity, you wind up with everything because you have all the leading ones and all the non-leading ones, and that winds up giving you all the columns. And it's like Jack Spratt could eat no fat, his wife could eat no lean, and so between the both of them, they look the platter clean. That's a famous rhyme. Uh, in other words, every column either has, has, contains a leading one or does not contain a leading one. So, if you, so between them, you have all the columns, which is N. And now I could say a full yay.